Hello everyone. Can you hear me okay from where you are? Uh, anyone need me to use the microphone? Or is this fine? Okay. How about, does this work? Hmm, how does this work? Uh, how about now? Does that work? Okay, cool. All right, are we ready? Cool. Thank you for attending this teach-in on the inseparability of Islamophobia and racism. My name is Ariana Natalie Myers, and I am a PhD candidate in the History Department. Our session today will include an inter introductory lecture on the issue at hand, and the remainder will consist of a group analysis of some vital primary sources. Given that this day of action has been organized by a group called Princeton Citizen Scientists, I feel it is necessary to mention that, in the face of a stridently anti-intellectualist political and social movement, it is important to defend the humanities, social sciences, and arts, as well as what many refer to as the hard sciences. If recent events have demonstrated anything, it is that control over popular historical memory is a bitterly contested battleground, one which requires advanced tools to engage with, tools which the sciences cannot offer. It is my hope that this session will give you the basic analytical techniques to engage with history-focused ideologies and help you focus a better appreciation for why history is so much more than the rote memorization many take it to be. You're going to learn what to look for in arguments that rely on basic historical assumptions based on ancient ideologies of hatred. This will allow you to, shape, to help shape the historical narrative as we remember it for the promotion of a more tolerant and accepting world. The problem I am addre addressing relates to the massive surge in Islamophobia, or the fear and hatred of Islam and Muslims, in the United States and Western Europe over the past decade or so. This has been bolstered by intellectual figures, some of them scientists, who quickly took to attacking Islam in an effort to discredit the concept of religion itself. The self-described four horsemen of the new atheism, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett, have been especially prominent in this ideological campaign. These thinkers, who have sought to portray Islam as barbarous, uncivilized, and most importantly, antithetical to what they consider Western values, have been criticized for playing up old colonialist racist tropes. In order to justify modern imperialism and interventionism. Hence the standby defense they developed to dismiss these charges. Islam is not a race, they will say, it is a religion, and thus we are merely critiquing ideas. The defense of critiquing ideas has de been deployed a lot recently to pr promote all kinds of harassment, hate speech, and institutional violence, and it is my hope that that issue will be addressed in many of the other teach-ins today. Here, I am hoping to focus in on this claim that Islamophobia is somehow justifiable because Islam is suppo can supposedly be reduced to an idea or belief and nothing more. And as anthropologist Talal Assad wrote, there cannot be a universal definition of religion, not only because its constituent elements are historically specific, but because that definition is itself the historical product of discursive processes. In layperson's terms, the word religion does not mean the same thing to everyone. When people describe it as a set of beliefs or ideas, they are taking one specific definition which was coined during the Enlightenment and is heavily based on Protestant Christianity and extrapolating it to the entirety of human religion. In the case of Islam, Western intellectual attacks against it are not a new trend. The talking points we see today on Fox News have been honed and developed over the past thousand years. Western Islamophobia, you see, has a very extensive pedigree. When Norwegian terrorist Anders Breivik massacred 77 students in 2011, his 1,518-page uh, manifesto, among many other things, uh, declared his allegiance to the Knights Templar and called for a new crusade against Islam, which, so he and his sympathizers claimed, was invading and overrunning Europe. This historical declaration still holds immense appeal to many Americans and Western Europeans, who, though they may superficially embrace the notion of a secular society, are still very much founded in a predominantly Christian intellectual tradition. Indeed, one of the core diatribes these folks push is the specter of Muslims imposing Sharia law, which translates to law law, on the West, while conveniently ignoring Western Christians who seek to do just that with their own traditions. Islamophobes love to portray Islam as a violent, expansionist religion, converting people by the sword. There is a veritable mountain of scholarship discounting that premise, and yet it persists. Why? Because our recent scholarly interventions do not have remotely the power of centuries of ideological conditioning. But back to the matter at hand. What do I mean when I say that Islamophobia is inseparable from racism? 
Surely I'm not arguing that Islam is a, in fact a race. You would be correct, it is not. But people perceive it to be. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that the anti-Islamic polemics of the High Middle Ages, combined with anti-Judaism, profoundly directed the trajectory of Western racism as it began to crystallize in the late medieval period. Europeanness, which came to be equated with lack of skin pigmentation or whiteness, is inescapably linked to Christian identity. Here's a survey of the history of these concepts, altogether too brief, but absolutely a starting point for future investigation. But first, a quick disclaimer. I am a medieval historian by trade. Anything beyond the year 1500 AD is outside my area of expertise. I know only the broad outlines of the more recent history and can only make vague gestures at the huge historical discussions happening around those ages. But I will do my best to show the continuity and links between the medieval and the modern. You may be surprised to learn that for the first 400 years of Islamic history, there was vanishingly little interest in the Christian West in understanding Islam to any extent. For much of that time, if Christian thinkers mentioned Islam at all, it was to vaguely describe it as either a Christian heresy or paganism, with little to no grasp of even its most basic tenets. And before you say it, no, this was not because of the Dark Ages, the lands under Western Christ Christian rule continuously had a vibrant and creative intellectual culture throughout the post-Roman era. What is frequently forgotten is that for many centuries, the lands under Islamic rule were majority non-Muslim. Western Europe was just one of a great many places where Christianity flourished during the medieval period. In this light, the route of a Muslim raiding party at Poitiers in 732 AD by the Frankish Christian warlord Charles Martel seems considerably less impressive than the lionized legacy he was subsequently given as the purported savior of Europe and Christendom. If you were curious, this legacy of Islamophobia is the main reason museums will show maps of Charlemagne's empire as a contiguous whole, whereas maps of the early caliphate always show arrows emphasizing expansion. Even at that basic level, the established Western narrative of defending against an aggressor is reinforced. It was not until the mid 11th century that anything resembling the sense of urgency and hostility developed. Though there were hints and precursors to it, the call to crusade issued by Pope Urban II at Claremont in 1095 AD was largely unprecedented. We will be reading one version of that speech in the next part of the session. The goal of the crusades, however, was not to forcibly convert non-believers, though this did happen, especially to European Jews during the March East, but rather to replace an Islamic elite with a Christian elite. We must remember that many of the Christians living under Islamic rule at this time were considered heretics by Western Christians. And yet this did not prevent a narrative of fighting against perceived aggression from forming. And the crusade movement, as it developed over time, came to be directed not only against Islam, but against pagans, Christians perceived as heretical, or even excommunicated Catholics. During the Middle Ages, Catholic Christian thinkers referred to Muslims as Saracens. Pup propaganda and art from the period generally portrays them darker skinned and wearing distinctive clothing, but nothing approaching the caricatures of later ages. In this period, Muslims were understood as a distinct people, or gains in Latin, but it was largely accepted that one could become one through conversion, and vice versa for Christianity. Notably in the West, a Christian was forbidden from holding other Christians in slavery, but Muslims and Jews were legally enslavable. The reverse was true under Islam. Toward the end of the Middle Ages, around the turn of the 15th century, this had changed, most vividly in the Iberian Peninsula, modern Spain and Portugal, where a combination of ideas surrounding faith, honor, blood, and indeed crusade caused converts from Judaism and Islam ultimately to be considered ingenuine or impure. A Muslim or Jewish slave who converted to Christianity could be legally, legally kept as a slave. In 1449 AD, the city of Toledo instituted a policy that prohibited anyone who had a Jewish ancestor up to seven generations removed from holding public office. The monarchy opposed and suppressed that law and Pope Nicholas V issued a bull denouncing it, but it marked a sea change in attitudes. The policy was reversed in 1555 by Pope Paul IV and the purity of blood laws, as they were known, came to be instituted as the accepted standard. In 1492, the same year that Columbus prosaically sailed the ocean blue, the Kingdom of Spain expelled its Jewish population, numbering as many as 200,000, for fear that they were corrupting Jews who had converted to Christianity. In 1502, nearly the same policy applied to the Muslim population. We will read and discuss this edict of expulsion in the next part of the session. These changing attitudes coincided with the European conquest and colonization of the Americas. 
that's filled with significance. Columbus himself was obsessed with the zeal of crusade. His very voyage was an attempt to gain military advantage against the Islamic powers. The process of colonization in the Spanish Empire implanted many of these implicit attitudes and heavily influenced the subsequent development of its racial and caste systems, which was based heavily on proportions of ancestry. During the 16th century, there was a huge resurgence in crusading ideology in response to the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. Then, instead of Saracens, Muslims tended to be called Turks by Westerners, and there was a literary fascination with the idea of turning Turk or converting to Islam. Imagine to entail adopting all of the supposed cultural accoutrements of that shift. This was the early modern era, when Western Europe began to project its power worldwide and racialized chattel slavery developed directly out of its medieval, religiously based predecessor. North American racism specifically took its own direction based on its influences and circumstances, which ended up focusing specifically on ancestry and skin color as the indicator of racial caste. And yet while these racist ideologies changed, many of the underlying assumptions and ideologies remained the same. White Europeans still considered it their duty to uplift people of color, to civilize and especially to Christianize them in the Western tradition, while keeping them in a state of subjection and inferiority. And al always, no matter how strident racial ide racist ideologies were in proclaiming the supremacy of white people, there was always a profound focus on the power and strength of those they oppressed, the implicit threat which they painted to justify repression. This ideology, based implicitly on the crusade movement forged in the medieval period, was frequently appropriated or responded to by its opponents and victims. The abolitionist movement often described itself, like many American social movements, as a crusade. The figure of John Brown in particular looms large in such a discussion. Additionally, for many African Americans, Islam took on a special meaning as a religious alternative to in theoretical opposition to Christianity, given its significant presence in many parts of Africa. The Moorish Science Temple, established in 1913, was founded on the idea that African Americans were descended from Muslims of North Africa, and that Islam was therefore their ancestral religion. Nation of Islam, founded in 1930, sought to promote a similar idea and counted Malcolm X among its adherents. Central to this trend was the underlying social assumption that Islam was antithetical to Christianity, which, as we have seen, was deeply linked to the social institution of white supremacy. The resurgence in explicit Islamophobia, which we are currently seeing, is the result of a conscious revival effort by devoted propagandists over the past 30 to 40 years. Though globalism and multiculturalism had to some degree reduced its pervasiveness, after September 11, 2001, preachers of Islamophobic hate reached a fever pitch and rapidly made progress in radicalizing large segments of the American population against Muslims. What we have seen with the so-called war on terror and the re recent attempted Muslim immigration ban were the most recent manifestations of an immensely powerful and influential ideology of hatred, which has persisted for a thousand years. While this understanding can be daunting, knowing that it has not always been that way and it did not have to turn out this way is incredibly empowering. And better understanding of how and why this ideology came to be will allow us to more effectively recognize the rhetorical moves of its proponents and combat them. It is my hope that this all too brief inter overview has at the very least convince you that it is impossible to talk about Islamophobia and Muslims in our contemporary world without also thinking about race and racism. Okay, so that's the um, introductory lecture to the topic. Um, sorry about the page turning. Um, if I had a podium, it would have been easier. But um, So for the next part, I have handouts of uh, primary sources. I only have 11 copies, so people are going to have to form little groups. <laughs> so people could. You just weren't optimistic enough. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many uh, events, I had no idea the turnout would be this awesome. So thank you all for showing up. Um, so I've got handouts. Yeah. Yeah. Groups of three sounds good. So I'm going to... Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Does everybody have access to at least one or... Okay, cool. So the basic steps of historical analysis, and we don't have to go into major detail, but basically the first thing you want to do is identify the author, um, the audience, and try to pick apart 
what their overall goal with this um, document must have been. So I'd like to take about five, ten minutes to just read through the um, record of the speech of Pope Urban II, the first document in the handout, and uh, then we can convene and start discussing it. Um, if anyone has any questions about what to look for or anything, I'm here. <laughs> Okay, how is everyone doing with the document? Are we a good way into it at least? Got enough to go off of if we start discussing? Anyone object to starting discussion right now? Okay, cool. Um, so anyone want to tell me who wrote this document? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Anybody? Okay, well it says at the top it was Robert the Monk. Oh sorry, I didn't see. Uh, it was Robert the Monk and he's a, um, a, obviously a monk so he's a Christian and he's a Latin Christian writing um, 25 years after the speech happened. Um, and does that, what, 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 what does that tell us about what this document is? Yeah. Hearsay, yeah, to extent, yeah. Uh, sorry? Historical? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Not factual. Well, that's the interesting thing because when I read it, it's, it's kind of almost as if it doesn't matter whether it's factual because this is the report people are hearing about the crusade speech. And this is also, because it's 25 years after, this is after the crusade has already succeeded to Jerusalem. And this has already been a movement that's been expanding and growing for a couple decades. And people have had time to develop and digest this message to a greater extent. So it's perhaps a purified form of what happened or what entailed from the speech. So even if it's not exactly what the Pope said at that speech, it's communicating what a lot of people were getting out of that speech. Mm -hmm. since, it's all, since it's 25 years ago, it's basically your, like, your recount of what has happened, so it could be very selective. Mm -hmm. You might portray only the good parts of it, your, something that would confirm your own bias, or something that would confirm what everyone else has thought. So you would propagate those ideas and just try to erase everything that has everything that's bad that's on uh, during these crusades. So it's very selective, be very selective. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's definitely selective. He's definitely highlighting the parts that emphasize what he wants people to take out of it. Like, he, he really emphasizes how much he doesn't like what the Muslims are purportedly doing in the Midi Middle East. Um, but one of the interesting parts is um, when he's talking about the race of the Franks, the race of the Franks, O race of Franks, O chosen people of God. What does that say to you? I thought the Jews were the chosen people. <laughs> and that's the interesting thing, is that the Franks, Everybody's under the chosen. Carolingian Empire, actually used the Old Testament sections referring to the chosen people to refer to themselves. They say, well, this is our holy book, so clearly it must be talking about us. Um, and that's something that happened a couple hundred years before the crusade stuff happened, but it really got seized upon by people and developed as a sort of proto-nationalism of sorts. It's, a medievalist would bite my head off for saying that at a conference, but here I am saying it now. <coughs> um, let's see. So we know that Robert the Monk is not the Pope who made the speech. We know that he's writing 25 years after. We know that he's kind of a um, zealot of sorts. Um, we also know that a lot of what he says is corroborated by other sources. There are five surviving records of uh, what this Pope said, none of them by the Pope himself, none of them exactly during the day, but they all seem to have the same basic things. There's this constant notion that the Muslims over there, they're doing bad things to Christians and we need to save them, even though the people that they considered 
the, the people over there, they didn't really consider them full Christians because they were part of uh, different groups, the Miaphysite Christians of the East you may be familiar with. Um, and the interesting thing is that this becomes this core dialogue. Bad stuff's happening over there and it's a threat. We need to save them. Um, so how, does th how do you think this relates to things that we've been seeing more recently? How does this crusade rhetoric, the core of this ideology, play out in our modern world? Make America great again. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a concise way to put it. Um, the, the greatness that Donald Trump, for example, will refer to and what people implicitly understand when they hear him say that is restoring Christian supremacy and therefore white supremacy. Those things are very much conflated in this sort of Western ideology. And that's not to say that Christianity causes racism, and I really hope that's not what anyone goes away with this. It's basically saying that this system of supremacy, privileging of one group of people in society, gets perpetuated across time periods and evolves in very different ways, depending on what's happening in society at the time. Yeah. Um, any other comments on the First Crusade um, speech? Did George W. Bush accidentally call it a crusade? Did George, yes, um, George W. Bush did in fact call the war in Afghanistan a holy crusade for democracy. And that resonated very, very negatively in the Islamic world because the crusades, understandably, are remembered with infamy. The Catholic Church has apologized for them officially and that was unpopular to many conservative Catholics. Um, but, um, yeah. It, he described it as a crusade, and I think he later said that that was a mistake and re re retracted it, but a lot of people stuck with that, and it really set off a lot of people towards this extremist um, segment that wouldn't otherwise have been pulled in there. Like, for example, immediately after the September 11th terrorist attacks, a majority of Americans still had very positive views towards Muslims. And that didn't ha it didn't change until a couple years afterward, when these ideologies had time to gain ground and start warping the historical narrative to make it all about Islam instead of about imperialism and all of the other very equally serious things that could have been talked about. Yeah. Was this also reiterated for Kosovo and Bosnia? In Kosovo and Bosnia, um, I'm not as. Under, I don't know enough about that to make a coherent statement so much, but in that specific part of uh, Eastern Europe, I know that Orthodox Christianity is the um, dominant form of Christianity, and it, it manifests in different ways, but also very similar ways. Um, yeah, there's, de there's definitely um, a similar trend happening in Kosovo and Bosnia, but it's, it's not quite the same. And I focus more on the West uh, than the East of Christianity, so I can't, I don't feel like I can give a, a, as good an answer as that deserves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when Bush said that the, it was a holy crusade for democracy, that's really um, an affront to the constitution of the separation of church and state, and it's been getting worse ever since. An affront to the constitution? Um, many would say that, yeah. Um, I believe uh, Bush and his supporters would be less inclined to see it as that because they do not see the separation of church and state in the same light. Um, they would probably say um, crusade is just a word that we use to talk about a moralistic movement and in American history that has been the case but there's it's underlying a lot of uh, implicit code. attitudes it's, it's code. code exactly it's code for this ideology that a lot of um, w white Christian people in the United States understand at the core of their worldview but they don't explicitly know it or understand it per se some of them do and they preach about it to all kinds of different people, but a lot of the times it's just kind of laying latent and people can appeal to it with words and, and those code words like you mentioned to get them on their side. And we all know about the theory of rhetoric. Um, so that's kind of what's going on with a lot of this. The Holy Crusade for Democracy is in fact a really revelatory line that Bush threw out there because he's conflating Christianity and especially Christian supremacy with capitalist democracy. And that's kind of what I'm going at with this whole thing, is that those systems from the Middle Ages are still in existence in just a slightly different packaging. Yeah? Another important difference is that now 
know, um, Steve Bannon talks about Judeo-Christian values. It seems like the Jewish people have been somehow incorporated into the white race. Yeah. So the shift towards using Judeo-Christian as a code word for Christian in the United States is um, relatively recent. I'm not an American historian, so I can't specifically say when that started happening. I know it was in the last 50 years or so. Um, and <clears throat> that comes out of partially the um, attitude in the United States of the, the rhetoric of the United States, their modern historical narrative is that the United States is the good guys because they beat the Nazis in World War II and that's why they're the empire of the world right now. That's the basic narrative of the United States. And um, because of that narrative, it became less justifiable to openly hate Jews in the United States, though that is starting to fall apart as we're seeing recently. So it's kind of just like a smokescreen um, for what's actually, they just mean Christian values, but they throw the Judeo on there in order to try to pacify people and conceal it a lot more. They're just, they're, they're changing their um, dialogue to adapt to changing situations, just like the old Christian supremacy changed to racial supremacy, and obviously a lot more in between that, but um, it's all about maintaining privilege in the end. Any other? Comments on the First Crusade speech or anything relating to it? Cool. Well, um, I'd like to go on to the second document in the handout, which is the 1502 Edict of Expulsion from the Kingdom of Spain relating to the Muslim population. And you don't have to read it in super great detail, but I bolded a few essential sessions. And uh, yeah, so we'll give five minutes for that and then I'll get back. And again, if you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to get my attention. I'm right here. <laughs> Okay, has everyone got a pretty good grasp of the contents of the Edict of Expulsion? Yeah? Okay. So, who wrote this document? Or rather, who authored the law, per se? Anybody? Huh? Yes, the King and the Queen of Spain are the ones who made this decree. Um, and what do we know about the Kingdom of Spain? Christian, yes. In fact, um, Ferdinand and Isabella were considered the most Catholic kings. They were decreed that title by the Pope because um, they were considered the defenders of Christianity after they conquered the Muslim kingdom of Granada in uh, 1489. So, um, that given a little bit more context um, and knowing that this comes 10 years after almost the identical thing happened to the Jewish population of Spain, what, what's this edict trying to do? Ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing, Ethnic cleansing yeah, uh, to an extent. It's, it's also framed as protecting the integrity of the Christian population. Robbing them, getting their money. Robbing them, getting their money, yes. It constantly talks about, and their goods will be confiscated and given to our exchequer, yeah. Uh, their gold and silver. <laughs> like, yeah, they can leave with everything except their gold and silver. And uh, also, what about what countries they could go to after they left? Syria and Egypt. Syria and Egypt are pretty much their options. A lot of them ended up in uh, India, actually, too. But, um, yeah. In fact, uh, when Portuguese explorers first reached uh, the Indian subcontinent, they, uh, the people who ended up meeting them uh, in the port were former expulsees, and they were like, what the heck are you doing here? We thought we got away from you. <laughs> um, yeah? So it looks like there'd be no sanctuary cities. No sanctuary cities, yes, because they say explicitly that if anyone helps them, harbors them, or hides them, they will also have their goods confiscated and their titles of nobility stripped from them. So. Um, since it's being framed as protecting the integrity of the Christian body, what does, how does that relate to what we're talking about with white supremacy and anything you may know about modern American racism? Christians are white. Christians are white to an extent, uh, but Christianity is yeah. not all white. When they frame it as like protecting, they're implicitly saying like this population is worth more to us than this population. One population being worth more, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. <clears throat> 
take it like to a more explicit place like with the like religious test for refugees and where you let in the Christian refugees? Yeah. Because we have to protect the Christian minorities that are being persecuted. Yeah. That's that's definitely the rhetoric they're gi giving, and it's uh, it also dismantles their notion that the, when they say that this is not just about Islam, it's not just about race. They're 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 letting some people in, specifically exceptions to that law. Um, so something I was hoping that someone could say, yeah. That the um, uh, that that the uh, rule of law is replaced. Uh, by religion, basically. Rule of law replaced by religion? Well, this is the Middle Ages, so um, as I'm trying to hint at, there's not really that kind of separation, and there really never has been at any point in human history, I would argue. Um, but one thing that I'm wanting to mention just right now is, what about miscegenation law? How does that relate to what we're seeing here? Um, American miscegenation law? So that's, that's the ban on people of different races in the American system from intermarrying or having children. And what I'm trying to hint at is that this notion of protecting the integrity of the Christian body is in fact almost the same motivation as stopping white people from reproducing with people of color in the United States history. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, so, a little look of confusion, sorry. I just don't know that word. Oh, sorry. My apologies. What? What I do have to do is, we can that they are saying we have to throw them out even if they are peaceful, just to prevent. Even if they are peaceful, that's a very jarring line, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's because the very presence in the country was considered a threat. It's, well, you said it's better to prevent errors rather than to wait and punish errors after they have occurred. So they're saying these people are just going to do something bad, let's just throw them out now. Does that sound familiar? Yes. I also remember... Sorry? Oh yeah, um, they, were, they were specifically mentioning the um, part where it's talking about the, even if they're innocent or peaceful, we have to throw them out first because it's better to prevent anything bad from happening than possibly um, letting it happen and then punishing it. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> guilty yeah. before, uh, yeah. It, guilty before proven innocent, yeah. yeah. I also remember the word preemptive coming a lot. Preemptive. Lot, um, before the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. That was not about letting people in, it's about preemptively preventing them from doing something <laughs> Preemptively, yes. Preemptive has a lot to do with that because, um, as I mentioned, the, the core Western narrative is one of, we have to defend ourselves from the aggressors. How can they justify rhetorically invading and being the aggressor themselves by claiming it was already defense beforehand? You see, that's the rhetorical twist they pull. I saw another hand, sorry. No, okay. Um, anything else we wanna talk about about the edict of expulsion? Yeah. In, in the edict, but also in the discourse that you saw in the Crusades, it reminded me of something that came up in a previous session this morning about sanctuary politics, which was the, the intersections of the ethnic, racial, religious distinctions with gender, and how in many ways the, the distinction between us and them is couched in terms of men protecting women and keeping women pure and whatnot. Yeah. But also, occasionally, you see this with the later uh, edicts to expel even the converted descendants of Muslims in uh, the second century later, roughly. Uh, concerns of not wanting them to stay and have kids either. So it's just alarmingly similar to the discourse we see today. So if anyone couldn't hear, it's uh, very similar to discourses we see today and the notion that um, even after the Muslims who remained unconverted were expelled, 100 years later in 1613, the Moriscos, who were descendants of the Muslims of Spain, were also expelled for very much the same reason, the suspicion that they were all secretly Muslims. Um, and that 
kind of really emphasizes everything, I think. Um, and it's also the intersection with uh, gender in the notion that this is a very paternalistic ideology. It's the notion of protecting the pure and the innocent who cannot defend themselves. It's very, very masculine in its um, expression. Thank you. The basis of what needs to be defended is not, not at all clear. The basis of what needs to be defended is not at all clear. Well, that's the interesting thing. It's because to the people who are writing the document, it was clear. They thought they didn't need to explicitly state it. That's what I mean. It's not explicitly stated. We don't know what they're talking about. They say they want to defend the Christian or prevent them from falling into error, which means thinking things that are not the orthodox uh, religion. And from their perspective, they were saving people's souls. So for what it's worth, that's what, that's what their justification was. So, did I see a hand? Interesting too at the end they're talking about if any council or provost marshal or any nobleman tried to defend the Muslims or shelter them, mm -hmm. they will be punished financially punished. They'll be financially punished and also lose their nobility, which is possibly worse of it than death in um, medieval Iberia. Loss of all favor, confiscation of all their goods. That sounds very funny. Yeah. Okay. Anything else about yeah? practical question. How would they know that someone was Muslim? How would they know that someone was Muslim? Um, there, that's the funny thing. It kind of relied on word of mouth or um, some identifying factors. A lot of the times they did rely on caricatures at this point in history. Um, like they actually imposed laws saying Muslims and Jews have to dress this way so that we can know who they are in society. Very similar to um, well, the most famous example is, of course, the uh, yellow star, or the pink triangle under the Nazi regime, but almost the exact same thing was done at many, many different points of history because you couldn't tell who was who, um, usually. But they, they developed ways to try to distinguish people, and sometimes people willingly took up those things as, a, as an act of resistance um, to say, no, I will not assimilate. I will continue to be faithful to what I believe to be my way. Yeah. Uh, anything else uh, on that? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? I, I, being something other than... Yeah, so um, at the back of the uh, handout I gave you, I have a further reading section. And one of the titles in that uh, section is R.I. Moore's The Formation of a Persecuting Society. And that's a super famous book uh, in medieval studies. And it's about how in the 12th to 13th centuries, something fundamentally changed in Western Europe. And it became what he calls a persecuting society. And it's the tendency to look at other people who are deviant from the norm as not just not just violating norms but also being subhuman and that's something that really influences and i think is influenced by in in my opinion the crusade ideology which was rapidly spreading throughout western europe and nobody no historian has really fully been able to explain why that happened perhaps the only explanation is that it happened i was loud um well, you would think it might be something similar to what what's happened here, which is an undermining with the environmental climate change and instability and general questions that, that people become frightened. People what frightened? Kind of or some kind of <coughs> change from the Greek and Roman point of view, I guess. It's, it's a fundamental change, yes, but... Um, there wasn't really much climate change happening, per se, at this point in time. But, uh, in fact, during the High Middle Ages, um, some uh, scientists have tracked it, and anthropologists, archaeologists, have tracked it to being actually slightly warmer by a degree or two um, than other periods. I'm just wondering if there was some great destabilizing event. Some great destabilizing event? Well, yes, uh, during the preceding 100 years, um, the Carolingian Empire, you know, Charlemagne, uh, that giant thing, it kind of turned into something else where the local nobility, is very local powers, had all of the control, and they were very arbitrary in how they exercised power. There wasn't, there wasn't much rule of law. It was really unfair for a lot of the peasants who had hold, held their land for free. <coughs> these knights and nobles and all these people were seizing their land and treating them unfairly and breaking their own laws. And 
this, this is what motivated what's called the Peace of God movement in the um, 10th and 11th centuries, where it's, it's priests and the church in general who are trying to say, stop being violent, knights, start being Christian. And uh, it's actually many, there's been many, many links drawn to the Peace of God movement and the start of the Crusade movement. Because as we remember from that document, it's saying, stop fighting each other, go fight them instead. Yeah. One more thing. Oh, no, it's not a question. I was just oh, okay. So um, I think that's about what's going to wrap up our session. Um, I wanted to thank you all for participating and for your feedback. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'm going to be standing around here so you can feel free to talk to me afterward. Um, so. So some people say that studying history is pointless, meaningless. Um, I really want you to be able to remember, now you know what people are all really saying when they say things that are bigoted like this. And you don't have to concede the tr kind of historical truth that they're trying to push. So when someone says, oh, well, we're just defending ourselves from the Muslims, you can say, well, actually, there's a history to that idea. Let me tell you what you really mean when you say that. So, yeah. <laughs>